podcast is part of the Pod Syndicate family. For more criminally compelling shows, articles, and conversations, head to wearepodsyndicate.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this bonus episode on the Chin Stroker versus Punter Feed. Uh, Paul is not joining me for this bonus episode, but I believe that uh, his absence will be more than compensated for because, as listeners will know, uh, we are long-term fans of American science fiction epic Babylon 5. So uh, we've recently uh, had two out of three of the lead actresses from the show, namely Pat Tallman and Claudia Christian. And I'm happy to say that we've now completed the trilogy as we have one of my favourite actresses of all time, Mira Furlan, joining us. So oh, thanks so God. much for joining us, Mira. How are you today? Thank you. A lovely words. So kind of you. Thank you. Thank oh, absolutely. You my pleasure. It's great to have you here. Where in the world are you today? Uh, that's a question I've been asking people a lot recently because of all of the, the madness that we're finding ourselves in. I am in Los Angeles, sitting in the garden of my house. And I'm you know, grateful every day that I have a little piece of land and a little piece of grass and a little piece of, you know, earth and some trees and so on, because... Uh, it's been weird. It's been strange being inside. But I'm, you know, I'm debating right now with myself, you know, whether to um, uh, travel to Europe to finish this play that I was doing yeah. when the whole, you know, catastrophe uh, struck. And I came back on the 13th of March. I came back to America, you know, um, on the last flight beca- before the ban of all European flights that, that, you know, so, so it was all very dramatic. So now I'm thinking, is it time to fly? And I'm, my whole being says no. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's very little precedent for us to look back to for guidance in this, is there? Exactly. You don't have any guidance. So it's up to you. You know, I don't know. You ask your friends, nobody knows. You ask the authorities, nobody knows. I mean, who do you, how, <laughs> How do you know what to do, right? Absolutely. Are we overcautious? Are we not, you know, are we not cautious enough? <sighs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I suppose this, this this question of geography and movement is something that that you know a lot about, Mira. I mean, we've, I mean, you, you, you yourself, you're from obviously the the former Yugoslavia, where you had a a, a very successful career in theatre and both film and television, including, I've got to say at this point, a real favourite of mine. Um, um, Emir Kusturista's um, When Father Was Away on Business. Yeah, um, that's that, a beautiful movie. Yeah. And, and that, that's that's one of those films where I can't imagine it being made. It just feels like a film that just kind of appeared fully formed out of the ether. <laughs> and I was <laughs> just I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your experiences on that film because it's one that I, I I've adored for a very long time and. Um, it was, I mean, at the time, there was a, and even now, there was a lot of buzz about that film. I mean, I believe it was nominated for an Oscar. Uh, it was the Palm Door winner. Um, can you tell me a little yes. bit about your experiences working with Emir and your, your experiences on that film? Well, you know, he, <laughs> well, you know, as an actor, you always have a very, very uh, intimate experience, your own personal little angle, right? And, um, um, for me, things were tough at that shooting, you know, for, for many, many reasons. Um, but the movie came out great, and I, 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 I'm very happy that I was a part of it. But um, um, it's interesting, you know, the, the success of the movie and even the quality of the movie is not necessarily linked with your own memory, mm-hmm. you know, of the, of the experience that you had. And sometimes, you know, you have this lovely and wonderful experience with the people, with your collaborators, with the director and so on, on a movie that comes out and it's horrible. And then yeah. you have a really bad experience on a movie that, that is wonderful or, or a TV series. That, that's so I interesting. Many of those. That's yeah. so interesting that you might end up with a, a film where the result right. is perhaps artistically what, not what you were hoping for, but you've got a wonderful exactly. home movie of a wonderful experience. Um, right. And are you able right. to separate the two in your mind, particularly when, for example, the, the, the uh, uh, and I understand for somewhat obvious reasons, considering the content of the film, what you're speaking to there, but if you've had perhaps quite a, a, a gruelling experience making a film, but then the, the result of the film is something that's so... Uh, rewarding to to have been a part of. Are you able to separate those two things in your mind when you're viewing the film as an audience member? It's very hard. You know, it's very hard. Uh, I usually don't like to watch anything that I'm in. (laughs) 
just because of that, you know, because your own internal intimate experience overwhelms you and you can't really judge it as a work of art, right? You know, all these all these personal relationships and, and also, you know, we had a we had a horrible you know, path in the former Yugoslavia with the war and so on. And many people took, uh, you know, a different side than than what was my uh, feeling about uh, the war and so on. And the director of that particular film, um, you know, took a completely different path that I couldn't understand. I couldn't justify it and, in my mind. And so, you know, we are all very divided. It's It's very sad. Very sad I when think I think about it, you know, and and also uh, that movie, that particular movie, you know, was the last movie or maybe one of the last. But I would say the last big Yugoslav movie, right, with an all Yugoslav cast that came out of all these different um, communities and different states. Me from Croatia, uh, other people from Serbia, many people from Bosnia and so on. So it was, a, you know, it's very sad. When I think about it, you know, how it all collapsed and how it all, uh, you know, went through this self-destruction kind of phase, you know, yeah. that never that never stopped, never ended there. So it's 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 hard to think about that without that knowledge and without that experience. I mean, of course, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very interested in the space of your career for a number of reasons, because, I mean, you must feel like. You, you you have had a, a career of two halves, or I suppose a life of two halves in many ways. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you so as, as a lot of listeners will probably know, we've got a lot of Babylon 5 fans in our audience. We've also got a lot of fans of, of European cinema as well. I mean, it's, it's well known, of course, that you, you, you left um, Croatia in the early 90s into quite dramatic circumstances. And um, I don't want to get into that too much because I know that you spoke to that in many venues. But what really interests me about that is I understand that you're looking for I suppose the right venue or the right mechanism to tell that story yourself and I was just wondering if you could tell us I suppose a little bit about this experience and the transition but also any potential projects that might be coming out of that I know that you've spoken in the past about your interest in writing about that experience I wrote a book (laughs) it's done more or less, you know, what is ever done and, you know, uh, whenever I go back to it, I want to change it all. I've been writing all these years and my, uh, so it's very, it's it's hard to, you know, in my kind of double existence, you know, in two languages, in two cultures, in two worlds, um, I'm a different person. I address different people, you know, different kind of audience, different profile of audience. So, that I have to figure it out in my head how to how to how to put it out but I actually decided and and um, I decided to put out the second half of my book um, and that will come out uh, and I will I, I think I will self-publish it um, and it will be uh, uh, a book about my I mean it's done uh, it's a book about my experiences in America so it's the second part <laughs> of my book but that main book I'm still deliberating you know um, I wrote it in English and I'm, I'm very um, the thing is when you write about uh, such an experience about the war right that completely divided people, divided families, divided, you know, <laughs> people, husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and so on. It's, unbe- it's an unbelievable amount of responsibility. And I am, you know, this baggage, this responsibility weigh, weighs on me. And, and so I, I have to deal with all that, you know. And um, I was thinking, you know, not that in any way I would even think of comparing myself to him but Mark Twain for example wanted his autobiography uh, to be published 100 years after his death (laughs) (laughs) so you know so that's one of the options I mean um, because I'm so tired of all the controversy that I constantly cause in my country you know whenever I, I just said a just now actually (laughs) <laughs> I had one of those uh, things happen, you know, where I say something and then it becomes, then it's taken out of context, um, you know, put in all the media with this incredibly malicious kind of uh, uh, context 
that is uh, superimposed on my words, right? Mm. And that creates such a, you know, a feeling that I just cannot get through, right? Um, that that I'm not being heard, mm. right? Um, so it's tough. <laughs> I suppose. Right, we, I mean, so. it's a difficult time as well. I think because it I think is. I think we live in a time where it's very difficult to have any kind of nuance in conversation or in discourse. Um, right. I think obviously things. You know, everybody blames social media, but I think there is validity to that. That um, it's very difficult to have conversations where there is any kind of nuance, and it isn't just one, one side sort of versus another. But. Um, but I mean, I suppose just just to sort of return to the the the, the biographical tract here a little bit. Um, I mean, you 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 found yourself in America in the early nineties, and uh, am I correct in understanding that you your 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 early experiences in America were on stage? I mean, were you did you join was it did you join the Actors Studio? I believe in the early nineties. Yes, my first job in America was on a play called Yerma mm-hmm. by, um, and I played the title character, and uh, uh, it was um, uh, a play, it's a famous play, um, kind of an interestingly feminist play by uh, uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, the anti-fascist mm-hmm. Spanish writer who was cal- killed by uh, the fascists, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, from a from a you know the story is told from a female's uh, from a from a, a woman's point of view and in the end she kills her husband and I, I remember in Indianapolis that we did it in Indianapolis that people were actually cheering at the end you know wow. American audiences were like yeah you know and I was completely shocked another world um, <laughs> the world where people in the theater cheer. Um, was the theater a comfort to you at the time with the, with that transition? Comfort. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, there were many issues that I had to solve at that time. Uh, first of all, my papers, right? Uh, my whole immigration status and so on. And that theater uh, did a lot of uh, work on, on my behalf. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, and then the Babylon 5 pilot came came in. And that's how it all started. You must have just thought, I mean, looking at your early days in America, um, uh, when you'd moved here in the early 90s, you must have thought, this is wonderful. They're giving away roles at the airport. I've, I've got theatre work. I've got this uh, this, this, this TV I show. Uh, I mean, that, that I all know. happened so quickly for you. That must have been very, very encouraging, I'd imagine, at the time. Sure. You know, suddenly I found that I, I lost everything. I came without anything. And suddenly there was another community another first of all my tribe at least that's how i saw it or them at that time i i i'm no longer i mean i i, I don't feel it anymore that strongly but it, those are the people that i belong to you know i came to the babylon five set and suddenly i knew the people i knew i mean i didn't know them but i knew them right from my former life those were my people the gaffer the you know the dolly puller and you know the focus puller i mean i you know it, it, i was in my i was home you know i was i i came home in a way and the theater also right those were my my communities my people my my environment at the same time everything was completely different i had to function in a different language in a different culture um you know i was shocked in theater and on the on the at the shooting for Babylon Five, I was absolutely shocked, primarily by the speed that people work yeah. here. Right? I mean, tuck tuck tuck. You know, time is money. That whole thing. I lived in a socialist country. We didn't have money, but we did have time. Oh yes, we did have time. So, time was you know. And, and I hear no as well. Problem. I mean, from from. Um... I remember hearing a story. Funnily enough, Mira, you, you and I actually met many years ago, um, very briefly. Really? Yeah, at, uh, I and this is I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to show my true colours here. Uh, I actually attended <laughs> a, I attended a Babylon Five convention back in the '90s, back when the show was on the air. Um, in Blackpool, in England, um, it was around. Oh my it, God! It, it, that was the time. That was when, when everything, we were the Rolling Stones. Yeah, yeah. I'd heard, you know, my favourite TV show was having this big convention. Just, I've talked about this on the show before, 
actually. And I spoke to Claudia a little bit about this because this was when a lot of things went down with Claudia that weekend, obviously, with the contracts and all of that stuff. That was that was happening at that at that convention. Right. Um, oh and, my god, I uh, know, I know. I remember. Oh my god. I remember so many details. Yeah. <laughs> that very, 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 very exciting. Remember. And, and I know that yes. you, Pat, and Claudia do a lot of things together as well, so I'm sure that you guys have a have a lot of fun with that with with, with, with those stories. But it's funny because I remember that was that was around the time it was towards the end of season four of Babylon 5 and it was changing networks and there was a lot of changes going right. on. But as you say before, I mean, you guys, that was a following and, and fandom and, and conventions have changed a lot over the years. But that was the first time that I ever saw a show, not just science fiction, or but a show itself being celebrated to that level. What was it like being a part of that? What was it like being a rock star? That was incredible. I remember us getting on stage. I, I, that moment I'll never forget, you know, and 80,000 people were in the audience mm. cheering us and, and adoring us. So it was a good feeling. I mean, I, <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting behind the stage. Stage. behind it all was a whole other agenda happening and I'm I was absolutely shocked yeah. when Claudia didn't come back I mean I couldn't understand that I still can't but um oh well it's a, <laughs> it's a funny business I mean the, the reason I bring it up was was that I mean you, you were speaking to um, this this idea of time luxury of uh, cinema rehearsal mm-hmm. television and I think it's fair to say, and I think I think Joe Straczynski said on, from stage in Blackpool about how even by television standards, Babylon 5 had a very accelerated production schedule. It did. Um, it did. And uh, I'm yes. just wondering, I mean, you know, you, you were on that show for five years. You know, you, you this wasn't like this, this, these days of, of basic cable of 10 episodes. You were putting out 20, 25 of these, these a year. What was that like? What was that work schedule? I mean, you spoke before about the initial, I suppose, language barriers or culture barriers. Um, did you just strap in for those five years and kind of ride it out? What was that experience like? Well, I mean, it was great. You know, it's, uh, it was uh, I. I had to get up at three o'clock, right? Uh, I mean, two thirty actually, two thirty. Wow. I, I I remember that you know looking at my at my alarm clock by the bed and and seeing the, that weird picture and not knowing whether I'm going to bed or I'm just waking up. I, I, what's going on? Is it day or is it night or what am I doing? Uh, you know, but then you drive to the set through the completely dark city and you feel that you're doing something for yourself, for your family. I mean, you know, you're a you're a worker. I, I felt as a worker, <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. night shift worker. <laughs> the people, I mean, you, you, you heard that from so many of us. But really what is different and what is extraordinary with this show is that we somehow liked each other truly liked each other and stayed real friends in real life you know i we call each other we're we're there for each other if anybody is in trouble we'll come i know that if i call pat tolman or if i call bill mumi you know if i don't know if a thief comes to my house i know these people claudia too you know those are people that are there for me and i'm there for them and that's almost unheard of I mean, I worked so much in my life, you know, in, on both continents, um, and I've never experienced that. Never. I've never stayed in touch with the whole cast of a show that I did, of a movie that I did. Never. And I think you so can see that. Really? I mean, yeah, I think. I mean, it's funny. You, you're, 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 as an actor, you'll probably be mortified to hear this, but the, um, the, the outtakes, the blooper reels from Babylon Five, are quite available out there and that gives you a real glimpse as to the relationships and the 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 atmosphere on the set you know and it's a it's it's a real great slap shop i'd just like to um talk a little bit i suppose specifically about the the character of delaine uh i mean it's 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 been discussed before about how um joe straczynski was a great receptor of information um and would incorporate elements of 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 your experiences and the um the historical sort of geopolitical contexts that you had you had found yourself in i'm just wondering a little bit about that but also 
is the and this is such a, a, a novice non-actor question but is the is the process of creating an alien character with all of the connotations and the lack of cultural context a different process to creating a character um who would exist under more normal circumstances is it more collaborative right. is, how does that work interesting well uh, my uh, answer would be not really yeah. right because you're the only thing that you have as an actor, you know, is you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's your experience. So that's what you use. Um, but this feeling that, that you know, uh, how would I say that? That, it, that you're kind of removed from, let's say, ordinary life to a certain degree, you know, the, the ban- banality of ordinary humans. That was there, right? Uh, it's a little bit elevated, I think, in, in the way I did it and in the way I saw that character, you know? <laughs> I like, I mean, you know, when, when I think about her costumes, that silky dresses, she was... She was a little bit above the ground, you know, and I, 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 I appreciate yeah, she, that. Yeah, Dylan that. didn't walk. She floated, didn't she? She floated yeah, through scenes. She floated. <laughs> uh, that ethereal sort of elven, elven quality. And, and it's interesting because, I mean, the character did change. I mean, not just in, in the sense of us learning more about the character and the natural evolution that the story art brought out. But I suppose also the, the um, you know, there, there was, a, there was a, a significantly visual difference to the character in the pilot. Uh, there was an androgynous um, elements of the character, and I'm just wondering how was there, was that change? Was that change brought on by yourself? Was that around the makeup, or was that just a natural story evolution? What, what was the sort of the chronology of that? Right, I, it's interesting that you ask me that. Uh, people ask that a lot, uh, thinking that we actors have that much power, right? I mean, sure. I'm sure that Tom Cruise has has that power, <laughs> but but you know, I mean, if I, in fact. Only once did I go to John Straczynski's office and told him about my problems with my eyes. You know, I developed this, this, you know, this, this uh, thing with my eyes where they were, they were tearing and, and they were hurt and so on from all the, all the makeup just above my eyes, you know, that was the makeup that was covering my eyebrows. And so I begged, I humbly begged <laughs> that he, you know, liberates me from that piece that covers my eyebrows and I'll never forget the sentence that he told me when I you know when he saw me humbly begging he said impossible mean Baris don't have eyebrows <laughs> period that was the end you can't argue with logic and like that knew, can you? you know who, who would know about what how mean Baris look <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, you know? but that was that was the line that was that was not to be crossed <laughs> and, and, and i suppose also you, you had the solidarity of your of your colleagues who were also made up because i think that one of the things that is most commonly said about um babylon 5 and this is no slight on on any of the actors who don't fall into this category but is the quality of actors in the alien roles is really quite remarkable um and i'm just wondering if you've got any Thank thoughts you. about that is that i mean is that coincidence or is that just that to act through makeup requires a focus and an intensity that um it just seems to me that i mean even not just you know the key roles of yourself and andreas and peter who i think anybody would would uh, would agree putting you know remarkable sort of transformative performances that evolve and have nuance and and um, levels um but um wh- why is that what why why is the alien acting in babylon 5 so astonishing Wow. Well, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, it's beautiful. So nice to hear, um, you know, that somebody actually sees it, right? Because, you know, when you went, I mean, as uh, when I went to, I don't know, search for another agent, let's say, which I was doing at the time of Babylon 5, you know, these agents would say, oh, but what do you play on Babylon 5? Oh, you're an alien. Ah. You know, it was dismissed. It was kind of a second class citizen among among actors. Mm. It's interesting, you know, kind of the racism that is so prevailing everywhere was also present in the way that the, you know, alien actors were treated. I I remember at one point, you know, it's all as always, it's all very subtle, Mm. right? But it's not taken as seriously as the 
non-alien acting. You know, that, that's that's the truth. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting. And, that, know, and that's it's ironic as well, because if you look at the merchandising and the marketing of the show, it's those alien characters that are front and center in, in the selling of the, ha, of the shows. Interesting. Right. You know, but it's... not in the respect, let's say, that you got, right? And the appreciation. It was, it was, it's, it's a strange uh, discipline. It's hard. Uh, you know, the alien makeup, uh, I mean, I had to adjust my whole way of thinking about acting and about myself. And it was a learning process, right? Um, you know, the, 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 my makeup in the pilot was absolutely horrific. Mm. I mean, I was deeply unhappy. <laughs> but then I told myself, and Andreas told me, you know, Andreas told me a crucial thing. I was unhappy, you know, sitting there in this, looking like a monster, you know, and when people would approach me, they would, I mean, they would always like uh, issue this startled little sigh, like, huh? you know, that kind of thing. So they, it's not that pleasant when people no. <laughs> do that when they see you, you know, it's a little, mm, okay, that's me. All right. And who am I? You know, I mean, you're so used to I mean, the, the main thing uh, in, in this profession is to 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 use your face. Right. To I mean, so suddenly you you have no face. Right. So where are you? What do you do? What are you doing? All these questions. It's a it's an existential question, you know, uh, really like deep, deep question. But Andreas came to me and said, Mira, just remember. All theater, all acting started with masks, mm. you know, in ancient Greece. Mm. Andreas and so was Greek, it. wasn't he? So, I mean, he, he was qualified he to was uh, make that statement. He would <laughs> always invoke our connection. You know, we're, we're neighbors. We're neighbors. Yeah. We stick to each other. The European contingents. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> European connection. And the Balkans connection. Yeah, yeah even, of course. Even more specific. Mm. And he would always say to me, you know, uh, just be calm. Andreas never, never complained, hmm. never, about anything. He looked like he, he had a great there. time on that show. And the scorching heat, I mean, you know, Southern California, I mean, the heat, unbelievable. We were there in the mo in the hottest part of Los Angeles and, uh, you know, covered with all that latex. I mean, you can imagine how your body feels. And he would come to me and said, just calm down, you know. Uh, remember the old ladies in our, our countries, you know, how they put in the middle of the summer, they always dress in black, mm. you know, in black covered, covered, they covered their, their, their heads and everything. So, so the, and Andrea said, you know why? I didn't know. Uh, why? Uh, uh, because the sweat cools you down. So, wow. That's a useful, useful remember, context. Remember that. That's a that's a brutal one. Yeah. Well, the, the next time I'm experiencing some mild first world discomfort, <laughs> I will remember Andreas. I will invoke Andreas's wise words. I've, I've got Excellent. A, I've got I've got a quick question. I suppose about process, um, because um, I would imagine that that it's very tempting to make connections between theatre and television. Um, but I, I would imagine that it'd be extremely different as well, in the sense that. Playing a, so playing a character like Delenn for five years, for example, and living with that character, is that in any way similar to the experience of living with a character over a prolonged engagement in the theatre? Or does the fact that the, a play has a static text that is the same night after night change that experience of living with the character? Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting questions. Um, you know, y uh, yes in a way it's similar it's 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 a known territory that you that you tread that you enter uh, you know you you the territory of your character that that has been established so uh, but theater yes you you're right it's a, it's a, you know although although it's the same template it's the same text it's the same words it's the same movements in theater it's never the same you try new things every day is a new day and you are new and different so that's what you should you have to explore and that's what you have to focus on because otherwise it becomes grueling and you, 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 you don't have any fun or any inspiration to do it But and that's a problem a little bit with, with doing a series for such a long time you know you, you, you get to be 
even almost too comfortable. You know, it's like getting into your old shoes, uh, yeah, into your old, old slippers. <laughs> <laughs> so you have you have to be wary of that. You have to be aware of that 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 can happen. That you would somehow think, oh, ah, I've done it so many times. Ah, who cares? And that that, so, that comfort. I'm just wondering, do you, as far as how much of that you take home, do you ever? It's going to sound like a very silly question. Do you ever dream as your characters? Do you ever have that level of internal sort of experience? That's interesting. Wow, what an interesting question. That is something that I'll think about, you know. That's an interesting interesting uh, writing assignment. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. When, 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 when you, we'll have you back on when your book comes out. And, and we, can, we, can, we can pick that one up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Um, I like that one. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I have many, many... Um, in the past, when I was intensely working in theater, I had those typical, um, you know, uh, actors' dreams, these nightmares where I can't find the stage, where I'm roaming around the dark corridors and halls, and I hear my, 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 you know, my cue, and I know that I have to be on stage, but I can't, I can't get there. And the panic rises, you know, that sort of dreams. Or you wake up on the stage, uh, the, the curtain goes up and there's audience and you have no idea what play it is, what you're supposed to say or do. And it's this feeling of, you know, <laughs> I want to die, you know, <laughs> like what's happening? This, it's, it's mostly the, the panic filled dreams sure. that I have about acting. <laughs> preparation anxiety. It's, it's, it's interesting as well, because I think that there's, um, my, I introduced my wife to Babylon Five recently. She adored it as well. She's not, a, she's not a science fiction fan, but she just loved the drama of it and, um, the, as I say, the, the richness of the characters in the universe. And Beautiful. I, 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 one of the things that I notice uh, in in your work in general, um, Mira, is I see a lot of mor- moral complexity. Um, so, uh, for example, the, I mean, the family in. Um, in uh, Emir uh, Strister's work are, for example, quite harmful often in their actions, but ultimately pull together in that way that families do. And Delenn as well, the character of Delenn has such a kind of, uh, I suppose like a defiant strength, but also I think crucially in this time, which is one of the reasons why I think Babylon 5 remains to be timely, the vulnerability to admit her mistakes and Mm. sort of wrong-headedness, which I think is in short supply these days. I mean, what that makes me Absolutely. think think to is, I mean, myself as um, as a white man um, have found that art, things like Babylon 5, characters like Delenn, have helped me sort of traverse being able to look at my own worldview and to start to understand mm. that my worldview is coloured by privilege. Um, and I'm just curious, I mean, and I think this speaks to your, perhaps your concerns about releasing your book. Uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, this idea of cancel culture that we hear a lot about, this idea of um, people having these um, things that they've maybe said or done in their youth or when they were different people um, and being held accountable for those, which, you know, arguably people should. Um, But at the same time, do you feel that that prevents growth, that that discourages people from having the comfort to admit that they've changed and what they thought before wasn't because that's something I see in your work a lot and it just got me to thinking that when I was rewatching some of your films. So interesting, your so your your questions. I mean, I have to I have to give you praise. I mean, your questions have such depth. Oh, thank and you. So uh, yeah, no, really. I mean, you. Well, you know, the moral questions uh, are such a big part of me you know and um i'm just you know i'm writing a blog i just want to tell you that and it's on my website and um it's, it's the website is mirafurland.net awesome. um uh, so i i encourage people to 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 see what i write um i also write a column for a for a paper in serbia and so i i i do a lot of writing right now um and i'm trying to figure it out you know writing for me is is a way to deal with all those things right where is our responsibility you know i i i right now i see so many parallels between the world that was collapsing before the war 
started in the former Yugoslavia and what's happening all around the world, mm. you know, with this movement towards right, you know, um, with this, you know, don't, 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 uh, I mean, uh, people think, uh, it's a, it's a word that's used too much. I think it's a word that's not used, uh, enough and that's fascism. You know, mm. fascism is coming at us through all the cracks, you know, in, in the whole world. It's never gone. So it's, it's a, it's a danger. I mean, we live in an incredibly dangerous times. And I feel that it's my, I really feel the responsibility uh, uh, to say something about it, you know, uh, almost like a warning. You know, because I hear the same words, the same hateful, divisive agenda right now in America and all over the, you know, Europe, Eastern Europe, Hungary, Poland, and so on and so forth. It's a dangerous world that we are living in because the genie has been let out of the mm. uh, bottle. And my experience in the former Yugoslavia tells me that genies that have been let out don't go in mm. by themselves. You know, we'll have to deal with that. And on top of all that, this corona thing, which is actually accelerating and deepening all the trends that we already have. Mm. You know, the division, uh, uh, the, you know, the closing of the borders. <laughs> it's, it's the dream come true for all authoritarian leaders. Yeah, I mean, who'd have, who'd have thought that a, a pandemic could be politicised? I mean, that seems, you'd have thought that that would have been unified. And I, I think that art has such an important role in this because I find yeah. that, I mean, I say, and again, I say this from, from a, a place of, of privilege as, as a white man, that somebody lecturing me or telling me isn't going to change the way I view the world, but perhaps... A character in a science fiction TV series who I like through metaphor can teach mm. me these lessons about self-reflection and about how the strength in admitting one's mistakes um, and that that isn't a weakness. I think is a is as powerful now and important now as it ever has been. Yeah, it's true. It's I totally agree. Yes, and that's why we need art. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just. I'm, I'm also curious as well that, that in the one of the other things that I see a lot in your characters, and I think this is very central to Delane, is a sense of defiant strength. And I'm just wondering how you conjure that because Paul, my my regular co-host, who who will be kicking himself that he isn't here today, by the way, has often talked about what a wonderful what he calls open faced actor you are, um, and about how. Uh, there's an ability that you have, Mira, to just convey so much with a look and convey shock and disappointment and those sort of complex, more complex relationships with a look. How do you conjure that? How do you bring that out? Oh, you, 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 <laughs> thank you. Such lovely words. I mean, I, I appreciate them so much. Uh, you know, acting is like living. Uh, you know, you you are who you are, and you if if there is an openness, as you said, and and this transparency that comes from me. I mean, it's mm. nothing that I, you know, fabricate or put together. You know, or, or learn. It's, <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's just who I am. You know, and and if that comes through in my work, then then that's the biggest, that's the greatest compliment that you can give me. You know. Uh, that it all comes together and you really are you know on that screen you bring that humanity i i think and that you know i hope that's visible and you then when you tell me it is i i feel happy and and you know yeah, that's it's, my reward it's, it's it's quite remarkable and um <laughs> and, and I, I think uh, i'm also wondering who are your heroes Mira, either in acting or just in in the world, who who are who are the people that you do or have looked up to? Right. You know, I, I think so much of it, you know, and and that's a big part of my book, the the, the, the my 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 books. You know, why did I choose America? How did I see America as a young person living in Eastern Europe? I fell in love with the ideas, but what are these ideas and and now that I live here, I see a whole other part. And I see how deluded we were in so many ways. But I also see 
that we knew something that is, you know, America is a possibility. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> um, it's not a reality, really. Uh, and we fell in love, or I fell in love with that possibility, right? Will it ever come true? We don't know. <laughs> and um, I don't know, my heroes, I mean, uh, there's, okay, immediately. You ask me that, and there is an answer that immediately comes out of my head, and that's Martin Luther King. I mean, it seems so <laughs> um, ordinary, right? Uh, but that, uh, you know, the humanity and the, the 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 you know this he for me he you know and people like him. So the rebels, the alternative. Uh, that's America for me. That's what I fell in love with, right? I don't know, Bob Dylan. I mean, mm. you know, <laughs> I thought that Bob Dylan could be the president. <laughs> Let him be the president of America. Um, so, but is that a realistic, uh, is that a truthful vision of, of this country? I doubt it, you know. However, that's what came to me. That's what I... Uh, that's what my brain and my heart, you know, got. I mean, this this braveness and and uh, the ideas. Uh, anyway, I could I could go on. It's such a it's it's a big subject, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, but I always responded. You know, I, I I teach at a at a film school and I teach dramatic literature. And one of my 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 the, the pieces that I teach, the plays that I teach, uh, is Antigone. Right by Sophocles. So I tell my my students, you know, read the first play ever written about the need for civil disobedience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, um, yeah, you know, politics, hmm, politics, politics happened to me. I was I was kind of thrown into it uh, without my will. I, I happened to be in the place that was in, that became incredibly politicized because of the circumstances around me. But I needed to act. You know, there was you, you're thrown in a situation where you have to make a choice. And I did. Um, and that's uh, and I, I in a way, uh, it brought me to who I am right now. Right. Um, and it's not about politics. It's about morality, I would say, you know. These are moral issues, you know. Um, so, okay. <laughs> I, I, was, I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, a lot of the time people will use the excuse of, oh, let's not talk about politics. But I think that now everybody in the world, everybody's politicized. Um, the communication being what it is means that conversations that were considered politics now are just are just conversations but um but i'd imagine also i mean the i mean the sheer diversity of of experience that you must have had not just geographically but also with people as well i mean you spoke earlier about the um the you know andreas for example and and your the the, the similarity of your experiences from a sort of geography perspective and the cast of babylon 5 but i'd, I'd also imagine this world of fandom this world of conventions and all of these things. And I spoke to um, to Patricia Torman, who's very, very inv actively involved in, in, in that world. Um, I'm just wondering, ha have you forged relationships in that world as well? Because I'd imagine that you'd be interacting with other uh, other actors from other shows and other participants. So maybe you can tell me a little bit about, about your experiences in that world. I mean, you know, uh, conventions. Okay, my, my first convention, I, I, I told that story, so maybe I'm going to you know, repeat it, uh, repeat myself. But um, I was my first ever convention in my whole life was in Stony Brook, New York. And um, me and Michael O'Hare were the guests. And that was immediately after we shot the pilot. And I remember talking about the war and how I came here. And I said something I had to start from zero. And, you know, it's like losing your family. I use that comparison. And somebody from the audience shouted at me but you've come to a but you found another family you know oh, you wow. come you 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 found your new family that's what he said you found your new family what an and introduction that, right and it's interesting you know uh how sometimes random people say random things 
that really stay with you. You know, they're stuck in your mind. You know, some random person in the street says something and forever, you remember it forever. Right? And that's one of those sentences that I remembered forever. And, you know, and it, it really, I, you know, it, it kind of stopped me in my tracks. And I, I looked at that person and I saw this huge amount of people looking at me and being there for me and really listening to me and really kind of getting it, getting my story, right? Um, and I thought, yeah, I'm, that's what happened. Yes. Well, I found my new family. I mean, I never, you know, Pat is the queen of fandom and she actually uh, is creating a business and the whole enterprise. Pa- Pat knows um, everybody, right. doesn't she? <laughs> it's incredible. Like every, everybody personally. I mean, she knows where people live and, you know, <laughs> what they like to eat. I mean, I, 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 I. You know, also, I have a problem with Facebook, um, ideological problems. It's very <laughs> hard. To, oh, my God. It's very hard to function in this world, you know, um, right now for me. Because, um, But anyway, I'm, I'm learning. And we, we did this thing together, Pat and Claudia and me. And that was fabulous. I loved it because I love the, you know, uh, the banding of three women. <laughs> I believe in in uh, female power and us being friends and collaborators and not competitors. That makes me think. You, you mentioned this this idea, this this the the, the, the three women thing, and there's a moment. Um, I don't know if you, if you're familiar with. Are you familiar with the concept of the Bechdel test? Um, Bechdel test, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I teach it. I teach it. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, and I'm um, <laughs> pre- preaching to the choir here. Uh, but there was a moment when I was rewatching Babylon 5 recently with my wife. There was a moment, and it's a tiny moment that doesn't draw attention to itself. And I don't think it was even designed to do this, where um, yourself, Claudia, and Patricia are on the bridge of a starship, I think the, the White Star. Ah. Um, and there's no men in this thing. Like This was like 1996, I think, this episode was shot. And there's no men in this scene. And these three women are doing this stuff. None of it's about men. <laughs> They're not talking Fantastic. about men. And and, it, and it, it seemed so organically. And I honestly believe, I don't think that Joe, when he wrote that scene, was consciously going, I will now get my liberal quill yeah. out and pen a scene for these three actresses. <laughs> I think that was just where the story went. And these characters were in the position for this. And I think for something like that to happen in an unspoken way, then... Is in, in such an unselfconscious way. It's really incredible. Yeah, it is. It is. There was that in Babylon Five. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's it was ahead of its time in so many ways. I think this is a Babylon Five question, but I think that it could probably apply to a lot of your work and to acting in general. I was just wondering if there's any scenes in Babylon Five um, or any moments that really jumped off the page, or that perhaps didn't really resonate with you when you read them but came alive when performed you know that that magic trick that can sometimes happen uh, I was wondering if any moments like that you know there was this moment uh, <laughs> starring Andreas of course who else right mm-hmm. um, what was the episode I don't remember the episode it was a conversation between us about uh uh, whether it's justified to kill a million people in order to save three billion people, right? So that they would do the so that was the discussion. And when I read that scene at home, I thought, right, yeah, like a theoretical discussion about uh, you know about that, a theoretical intellectual discussion about numbers and justification of doing bad things in order to, you know, for a greater good, blah, blah, blah. So I learned my lines. I came, you know, one of those scenes that you kind of don't think too much. It's just a little conversation. And as I said, theoretical intellectual debate. So I come uh, to the stage and we sit down um, uh, on, on opposite sides of the table, Andreas and I, and the rehearsal starts. And suddenly... The amount of emotion, the amount of anguish in Andreas talking about that dilemma completely shocked me. It was a completely different scene than what I read 
at home. I didn't see the potential. I didn't see the hidden emotional turmoil, right? Uh, that was also a part of that scene. But there was no discussion. It's not that uh, under, we discussed the scene. Not at all. He just did it and lifted me up. You know, I truly understood what it means when actors say, you know, how, what a wonderful experience it is and what a life-changing experience it is to work with a really, really honest and, and you know, <laughs> how would I say, present actor, mm. right? And with, with an actor with such, a, with such an emotional depth. Um, and how it lifts you, it makes you better. Um, so that's what happened and suddenly I was there you know I I I because I was present too and so he he lifted me he led me we were both in tears you know inside the scene in the scene wow. and I I realized what it was you know the uh, what these numbers represented what was behind them you know unbelievable so that was one of those things that happened yeah. That's amazing. In the moment. In the wow, stage, I'm going to go actually, and watch that yeah. scene now. <laughs> yeah, okay, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I don't, I don't know if the scene, you know, if, if my description, I'm telling you about my internal feelings. I know, I know, the, I know the moment you're speaking to, and it is a very powerful, powerful, right. sort of quietly powerful moment. And this speaks quietly. to this idea of, of, I mean, that's true. What you're describing there is a true act of creation. I mean, I know Joe's words were there, yeah, and uh, that there was that there was that there was power in wor in those words. But I mean, I spoke before about um, you know um, uh, Emilia Kusturich's work and, and the idea of things just coming out of the ether. This that feels like one of those moments. <laughs> right, it's true. That's the magic, you know, that you're searching. That's why you're doing it. You know, uh, these are these moments that 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 have this bliss that lifts you up from 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 ordinary life. And you know, that's kind of why why I chose this profession. Right? What what mesmerized me as a very young person on that stage when I did a you know I did a high school. Uh, production that changed my life um, and interestingly enough the the teacher that did it with us in high school so you know talking about Zagreb Croatia mm. former Yugoslavia socialist country so here comes a young English teacher who just finished Oxford you know a, not a breath of a completely different world and he decides to do a play with us and we rehearse this play every uh, every weekend for a year. Oh, my goodness. And we do it in English. So my first acting experience in my whole life was in English. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I, it, it truly changed my life. I, had, I truly had like a religious uh, experience on that stage. Yeah. Whew, it hit me, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the adrenaline, the excitement, the magic, the trans. The, transportation to another level you know that's that's kind of the transcendence of the experience that's i think what what made it for me it's truly really, i mean it's interesting you know it's it's the it's always throughout the history acting and act especially actresses were always you know theater was always the deemed as the profane thing right like you know, actors were buried, you know, in the Middle Ages, actors were buried uh, outside the uh, um, fortress walls because they were dis disrespectable, especially women, right? We know all that. But there is this religious aspect to, uh, to, 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 to that uh, realm. I, I truly feel it, right? This trans being transported in a different into a different uh, dimension sort of <laughs> I can't imagine fiction. I can't imagine a more rewarding life than than ch chasing transcendence chasing that 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 feeling that, that experience chasing and pursuing transcendence. And I, well yeah. yeah you know I sometimes well you know there are other aspects that are awful awful I mean so horrible and so soul crashing that you kind of 
you know, you sometimes you say, okay, never mind that epiphany and that you know transcendence. I can live without it. Just leave me. In but peace then you get a, then you get a taste of it again, and you're like, oh, but there it is. I remember this. I remember being that that, that young girl on that stage and right. feeling alive yeah. and feeling in in touch yeah. Yeah. with yeah. these things yeah. and that what an amazing true. thing. But um, but I think that's I think that's a great place to, to finish off. And thank you so much for your your time here. It's so generous and such a thrill. And, a, and an honor Thank for me you. to have a conversation with you. Oh uh, as God. I say, you're, you're, you're the most wonderful interviewer. You made my day. I needed it today. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with all kinds of things. And so I needed it. And thank you for your kindness and lovely words and true wow. understanding. <laughs> oh, I really appreciate that. And again, just uh, there are so many people out there uh, who are still so appreciative of your work in sort of uh, both in, in America and in Europe. And, um, uh, you know, thanks for bringing so much uh, humanity into our lives, Mira. So uh, uh, you have a great day. And if I could just ask you just to remind our listeners where they can find you on the Internet again and read, read the writing that you, you made mention of. Earlier. Yes, yes. Uh, Mirafurland.net. That's my website. And uh, I also am on Twitter um, at Furlan Mira. And, oh, my God, I was introduced to Instagram, but I am I, I can't quite connect to the thing so i'm right i'm right there with you on that one mira i'm not (laughs) used to this week (laughs) you know there are two pictures of my cats but i nah um twitter also has a big problem you know the hate mail and so on but i'm not reading it so you know i have a special (laughs) way Mm. of doing it anyway but okay. we'll, look, we'll look for look for your work out in those venues, and it'd be great to have you back on again um, when you do release your next project. And uh, thanks again thank so much you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. you have a great thank day. Thank you, Bye-bye. everybody, and thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. This podcast is part of the Pod Syndicate family. For more criminally compelling shows, articles, and conversations, head to wearepodsyndicate.com.